Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining today. My name is Mike Vanoy. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Assure. And today we have a little bit different topic. Normally, we talk a lot about HR and payroll compliance and HR trends and best practices around attracting and developing and retaining talent. Uh, we're still talking legal today, but rather than just the context of how to stay compliant with tax and HR laws, we're going to talk about the foundations, the legal foundations of running a business. Uh, so many companies uh, joining today's conversation probably have just started or are, are planning to start a new entity. But for, for most listeners, um, you know, we've been in business for a while, but may not have had the proper guidance for how to think about uh, some of the some of the major themes we're talking about today, whether it's what kind of entity do I have? How do I set up contracts? How do I, how do I protect my brand? Um, in, in making sure my business itself is on a good, solid legal foundation. I think maybe the good news here is that it's probably never too late to go back and do the right thing. Uh, and uh, I have a great guest today to, to help us unpack this information. So uh, welcome to today's conversation. My guest, uh, uh, Christina Gilbertson of the Gilbertson Law Firm. Uh, Christina is based out of the greater Denver, Colorado area where she serves uh, the mountain states. Uh, and has a lot of experience both in employer uh, and employment law, wage and hour law, but also just general uh, practice around helping small and mid-sized companies. So, uh, Christina, welcome today. I look forward to, to unpacking this topic with you. Thanks for having me back, me back Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah, very good. All right, so before we kind of jump into what we're calling, I guess, the, you know, the four the four uh, top actions that employers and, and small mid-sized companies need to take. Can you just kind of set the stage? This might sound obvious, but I think there's probably some not so obvious reasons why it's really important for businesses to, if not start out, at least course correct and, and have a solid legal foundation. Absolutely, and and you mentioned it a minute ago that it's never too late to get thing, get your house in order and get everything set up the way it should be to protect yourself. Um, all of us, we go into business not because we want to focus on all of the things that can go wrong in our business, um, but because we have a passion for what it is that we're doing or we want to help people or things like that. But um, we have to be cognizant as business owners and, and as managers of businesses that things can definitely go sideways that we may not necessarily see that happening, see it coming before it happens. And so by making sure you have a solid legal foundation in place, whether you're in year one or year 30 of your business, can help you weather those storms a lot more confidently and help make those issues be much less disruptive to your business and protect everything that it is that you're trying to build or that you already have built. So a lot of folks, that maybe have been in business for a while may be thinking to themselves, this doesn't really apply to me. Everything's been going fine. My business is strong. You know, I haven't had any issues. I've never been sued, no client issues, things like that. Well, knock, knock on wood. That's fantastic. And I, and I hope that that's what everybody is able to say, but I've seen enough times that it doesn't matter how long things have been going good, so to speak, and without an issue, you never know when something can come out of left field and kind of take you by surprise. And so you want to just make sure that you've done everything that you can to protect your business so that when that happens, you're able to pivot and deal, and deal with it. And it's not something that is going to completely derail your business or take all of your focus off of actually running the business. And so just there's some things that you can do right out of the gate that'll make your life a lot easier and help you to not lose sleep at night if you find yourself on the wrong side of a of a claim or a dispute of some sort. Yeah, I think that's really good advice, Christina, before we jump in. I, I mean, I, this is one of those things I think for existing businesses, it's so easy to ignore. I, I like it almost like to, to health. I mean, I might eat, I might eat Twinkies and drink Mountain Dew every day. <laughs> and hey, I've never had a heart attack. Why should I change anything? Well, <laughs> count my blessings. The heart attack is probably coming someday, right? And so just because we've never had any legal issues, much like the heart attack, it only takes once. It only takes one serious legal action, right? Some compliance action, some lawsuit, and it can literally wipe you out. And so uh, for, for many times, next to, next to no money, just a simple restructuring, reordering, uh, changing the way you, you, you go about things can just have enormous impact on, on how it protects you. Anything else you'd wanna say before we kind of jump into the into the, the top actions themselves? 
No, I think he just hit it on the head. You know, it's the things we're going to be talking about today. They're not earth changing or shattering things that you have to do to, to get your business protected. It's just maybe things that you've kind of overlooked or just haven't really thought about. And so really that's kind of for the, especially for those businesses that have been around for a while is kind of get those wheels turning. So you can kind of start thinking about, Hey, when's the last time I looked at my contracts or Hey, when was the last time I did X? And if you're just now starting off, it's always easier to start off on the right foot than to try to change course and correct things, you know, down the road. But again, it's never too late to do that work and, and make sure that you're on the right path to protect everything. Yeah. And I, I think that our, our first top action really ties back to that, right? Because I, if, if I'm a, maybe I own a home cons, uh, remodeling business where I spe- I have three to five crews in a given time doing kitchens and baths. But 20 years ago, I was swinging a hammer myself, right? And then eventually I hired an assistant and then I hired a couple more employees and then I had a crew and then I had a couple of crews. Or if I uh, started out my career as a hairstylist and later I uh, rented a chair and I was still self-employed, uh, but then I bought the salon and then I'm, I, now I have employees. So many times we grow into these things gradually over time that what may have even made sense legally at the foundation no longer makes sense. Can you, so let's take this first one of regardless of whether you're new or not, what, what are the different types of legal entities and how should, how would people know if they're classifying themselves, not classifying themselves, how, how do they know they're structuring themselves with the right entity type? Sure, absolutely. So there's four basic entity types for businesses and I'll talk about them all a little uh, briefly a little bit. The first is the sole proprietor. That's for, you know, you're the only one in your business. You haven't filed a separate entity with the Secretary of State. You're just doing business as you. Um, that is a, an entity structure. I don't know that I would actually call it an entity structure necessarily, but that is an entity type that I would never recommend to anybody to have. Um, the problem with a sole proprietorship is that there is no delineation between your personal assets and the assets of your business, and likewise, the liability between your personal and your business life. So if you were to get sued because of something you did in your professional side of things, that means that if somebody gets a judgment against you or something, they can come after your, your house, things like that. Whereas if you were to take that one extra step and register, say, an LLC, with the Secretary of State, that is an inexpensive um, solution that will very that will be able to insulate your personal assets from your business assets and liabilities. So, if you're a sole proprietor that hasn't done any kind of formal filing, I would definitely say let's take a look at that and see what we can do to get you buttoned up there. Um, the sole proprietorship is definitely the simplest side of things because nothing else, nothing is required to be filed or anything like that. You do one set of tax returns, that's all, all, everything shows up on your own personal tax return, and there's no separate legal entity for anything for your business. Right. Um, the partnership is similar to a, uh, a sole proprietor, just means that there's more than one owner of the business. And there's different types of uh, partnerships. You can have a general partnership, which is pretty much the exact same liability issues as what you would see with the sole proprietor in that the so all the owners are considered general partners, meaning that they're all subject to the same liability of each other, um, which will extend to their personal assets, everything there. Um, you could set it up as a limited liability partnership where you would have general partners and limited partners where the, the liability is just that. For the limited partners, their liability will be limited to their assets and their rights to the, within the business itself, but you'll still have a general partner that may be still having that subjection to their personal assets uh, being at risk. So a partnership, you know, that's a certainly, uh, I, I would say if you want to just be a partnership, do a limited liability partnership as opposed to just a general partnership so there is at least some level of uh, protection, at least for the limited partners. And that could be a whole different, uh, topic where we could spend a lot of time on the, what really what is the difference between a general and a limited partner um, that, that I don't think that's really where we want to focus today on but that is something that you know if you have questions about we jump through those hoops at another time. Um, the next type of company's entity structure that I want to talk about is a corporation. Those are 
typically, that's historically what you think of when you think of a formal legal entity. The corporation is completely separate and isolated from its owners, who the owners are called stockholders or shareholders, something like that. The corporation will file its own separate tax returns, and the, the owners will file their own separate tax returns, and there's a, a clear delineation there as, as long as you're not uh, commingling uh, your personal assets with your corporation. The thing with a corporation is it has some administrative bells and whistles and hoops you have to jump through. Like you have to have an annual shareholders meeting. You have to have bylaws. There's just different things that you have to do on a, on a regular basis to maintain that corporate identity. And so um, corporations for most businesses, probably especially folks that are on, on this webinar today and maybe watching this in replay, a corporation is probably going to be a little bit more than what you necessarily need to deal with just because of those additional administrative headaches and things that you have to deal with. So that's where um, the limited liability company comes into play or an LLC. So that kind of so, gives you the best. Christian, before we go to LLC, so um, what would what would be, and I think, I think you're right, I think probably for most listeners, uh, uh, if they, because, because, the corporations themselves. I mean, that's not just a webinar. That's a that's a year of law school for it. We could spend on that topic alone, right? Um, but just yeah. basic S corp, C corps. Why would someone, let's say a larger business, why would someone care or want the the extra level of protection from a true corporation versus where you're going to go with an LLC? Well, I think that if you're a larger company and you're looking to uh, procure capital and you're trying to be able to just to me in most cases it's going to be tied to raising funds to for the business itself by having it as a corporation you can issue shares whether you're whether you have that on the public market or not those the issuance and sale of shares provides income to the entity to be able to operate and to grow um, and if that's not something that you're really worried about you know I mean and you can have some some fundraising ability with an LLC as well but Typically, it's with a corporation. Is that that's the main reason when I'm talking to somebody why they want to have a corporation is because they want to take this company public. They want to make it huge. They want to have they want to be publicly traded and, and have that ability to raise capital from that in, in that regard. Or even stay private, but they want the ability to re, to raise private capital in a very structured, methodical way, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. So so t take us to to the kind of the punchline then where I think most people need to be in the LLC. Yeah, so the LLC, like I said, is kind of the best of both worlds, where it is a completely separate entity that you create on the Secretary of Website. It has its own tax ID number. It will have its own tax returns that, depending on how you're ultimately taxed, um, under that LLC, you can either be taxed. Um, the default is if you're a single member LLC, you would be taxed as a sole proprietor. If you are a multi-member LLC, meaning there's just multiple owners, the default would be you are taxed as a partnership. Um, in either case, you can also make the election to be taxed as an S-corp. It doesn't change your entity from an LLC to an actual corporation. It's just the IRS does not view the LLC as its own separate taxable entity type. Um, and so they say, you know, you either default to the sole proprietor partnership, or you can elect to be taxed as an S-corp. And again, that's one of those topics that's worthy of its own uh, webinar or, or of course where you can understand at what point is that S-corp election a possibility or appropriate for your particular business. Um, but really with the LLC, you don't have to have those annual meetings necessarily. You don't have to have uh, bylaws. It, it, it just doesn't have as many of the corporate hoops that are absolutely required of a corporation. I still recommend that LLCs have at least an informal meeting at least every year with the ownership, even if it's just yourself and you just kind of sit down and you kind of look at it and make sure that the business is still running the way that you want it to and that see if there's any tweaks that need to be made as far as the, how the company is operated. Um, but it is, it's, it's, and if it's inexpensive to file an LLC in most cases, like here in Colorado, the Secretary of State requires a it's a fifty dollar filing fee, and then every right. year you pay ten dollars for the periodic report. And as long as you have a separate tax ID number and you keep your LLC funds separate from your personal funds, technically that's all you have to do to maintain that separate entity 
and make sure that you're protecting your personal and business assets from each other. So that's the LLC is probably 95% of all new filings at least these days because because of the flexibility it affords while still offering the protection that business owners need. So so since uh since the LLC isn't taxed in and of itself, it just flows. So if you're if you're if you're the 100% owner of a business, uh, in the tax of the LLC, they're not taxed like a separate corporation. It just flows to your personal uh, income tax. So um, uh, so there there may or may not be you know, there's there's ways to deduct the taxability by running legitimate expenses in that business. But talk to us about it's inherent in the name, obviously LLC, Limited Liability Corporation. But share specifically why why pretty much in all cases everybody should be registering as an LLC, not as a partnership or a sole proprietor. Sure. So um, if you are trying to figure out why do I need to do that, then it's because um, if you were to get sued in your business, or you know somebody were to slip and fall, or whatever problem that your business may ultimately be faced with, um, then your liability as the owner, as long as you've kept your business and personal assets separate and apart from one another, and you're not commingling and paying for your groceries, your personal groceries through your business account, things like that on a regular basis, um, then your liability as the owner is, is going to be limited to what the assets of the company itself are. And so um, maybe it's the company's equipment, if you have equipment, or their bank account, things like that, whereas your personal assets are going to be insulated and you don't have to worry that, you know, if your business only has, say, $50,000 worth of, of, of equity in it or uh, value to it, and somebody gets a ju judgment against you for $100,000, you know, they're going to have a hard time as long as you've done everything you can and, and dotted your eyes, crossed your teeth to keep them separate for the entity to be, for the complaining person to be able to collect anything over that $50,000 that is owned by the entity itself. And of course, this is assuming there's not insurance and all those pieces, just using very simple, simplistic um, explanation here. But basically, the liability will be limited to whatever the assets of the company are, not your personal assets. And maybe the last thing on this topic uh, before we move on, because th th this is, <laughs> we can get into deep water really fast. Um, I think a, a common practice we see with especially small and mid-sized companies is you might have an owner founder um, uh, that will split out, uh, say, the real estate from the operating business, right? So uh, maybe I'm a maybe I'm a dentist office or dentist practice, uh, and maybe uh, I have one LLC that I own the property, and they and that LLC rents the property to the operating company, the, the dentist practice. What would be what, what are, are there cons? What what are, what are pros and cons? Why, why should businesses think about possibly entering multiple LLCs uh, uh, versus having just everything all in, under one umbrella? That's a great question. Um, in my world, I'm always going to, my, my first recommendation is going to be to try to split things up as much as possible into their own separate silos. Because again, um, in the situation that you just described, if somebody were to slip and fall on the property of that dentist's office, then yes, from where you sit as the owner of both the property and the business there, it may not seem like it matters whether it's all under one umbrella or not, but if um, you, you want to be able to still isolate the, the ownership or the, the liability and the assets of the, the entity the business itself and of the building itself and so if you have multiple um rental properties or things like that like i'll have i've had some people that um they have a bit a side business where they rent houses or something like that as rental properties and i'm always going to recommend let's have each entity or each address has its own entity tied to it again so that if somebody slips and falls on property a only property A is subject to any potential liability. It's not going to be across the board as far as all of their different businesses. And the same is true, like you're saying, as far as a business that's on the property that's owned by two separate LLCs, you want to make sure, say the business itself, say if, it's, if you're dealing with a dental practice, you know, there may be personal injury claims, you know, if somebody, a malpractice claim or something against the dentist because maybe something happened, somebody loses a tooth, you know, you want to make sure that only the assets dental practice and or the insurance of that dental practice are coming into play but that the building itself is isolated from any liability on the flip side 
It may be something where if somebody slips and falls outside, maybe that's going to fall on the landlord entity as opposed to the business operations. And you just want to make sure that you're clear as to uh, who's responsible for what, the aspect of maintenance and, and different claims that may apply. Uh, but just keeping as many silos as you can that uh, can limit the liability. And, and it can get it can get complicated, but you can have in some cases, you can have an umbrella entity that owns separate silos because one L one LLC can own another LLC. Um, but as long as you're again keeping things separate from each other, I mean that's basically the way you want to look at it. Each each entity is its own bucket of liability potential, and the more you can contain that into one little bucket without it spilling over into other you may own then the better it's going to be for you from a liability perspective. And that's the world that I live in. Is how do we minimize your liability to keep you safe? So I, I think we should probably stop there. Maybe I'll maybe I'll recap saying there's probably no level of complexity that we couldn't take this topic, right? Um, the nesting of LLCs. If I wanted to start a retail company called Mike's Top Hats and I had three locations, I might have three LLCs, one for each, and then I might have another LLC that owns those three. It can it can get really complex really fast. And there's a cost to administer that complexity, right? To keep separate books and because uh, if you commingle the funds in a court of law, the judge is going to say, hey, that's really just one business. Uh, you're not protected. Um, but uh, the, the point is, don't run around as a sole proprietor or, or a partnership. At, at minimum, consider maybe uh, 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 filing as a corporation, but at minimum, file as a limited liability corporation and consider splitting up into as many logical buckets as exists to protect your your liability in case something bad ever happened. Am I saying that right, Christina? Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. So there's guidance number one. If you if you want to drop now, that that's it. That's the most important one by far. Uh, but there are still three more things we want to talk about. Number number two is, is contracts. This is another one I yeah. think when people start out in you know I started out swinging a hammer as a as a uh, doing home remodeling, um, and it was my buddy. It was it, or it was a childhood friend that I hired to to work with me. You don't think about you know contracts with friends and family necessarily, but as the business grows, that lack of process that you started the business with all of a sudden becomes a real liability. Now, can can you talk about the importance of contracts, whether it's employment, uh, vendors, customers, etc. Absolutely, and and what you, the situation you're discussing is is one of the first things that most business owners learn the hard way because we we as individuals are we're trusting of other people we want to think that people are going to uphold their end of the deal you know and we don't think especially if you're dealing with a friend or family member you're like you don't need that level of formality you know we've been friends for 30 years he's not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize our friendship or damage my business in any way that may be true that may be the intention but you just I, i've seen far too many times where things fall apart unfortunately and then you're sitting there and it's got an extra added layer of emotion because you're dealing with somebody that you thought you could trust and it turns around that you know eventually that can bite you so you don't have right. to have a super complex contract i'm not saying you have to go and have a 50 page contract with 75 exhibits and you know that talks about like every possible scenario that can could exist but you want to make sure whether you're dealing with a business partner an employee um, real estate related vendors clients any of those um, different people that you may be doing business with on some level or another whether you're providing a service or uh, a product or if you're receiving some sort of a service or a product to help your business run you want to make sure that the terms of that relationship are reduced to, to writing you want to have things in there that are as simple as what are the payment terms? What's the scope of the services or the type of product being delivered? What's the time frame that the, that delivery and exchange is supposed to happen? What happens if you want to terminate that relationship? What do you, what hoops do you need to jump through to terminate the contract? What happens if somebody breaches their end of the deal? So you deliver on your end of it and you're supposed to be getting paid by your client and your client hasn't paid you. Well, are you allowed to take them to collections? Do you have to go to mediation? Are you able to recover your attorney's fees for chasing them for payment? Things like that, that a lot of business owners just aren't thinking about. And it's that layer of formality that I think a lot of people are afraid is gonna scare people off. Um, 
in that they're like, well, we're, it's a very informal relationship. So, and if I ask them to sign this contract, even though it's a three page contract, it's going to scare my customer off. Um, and the way that I counter that is it, 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 it's always possible. Yeah. It could scare people off. But if you look at it from the standpoint that it's protecting both parties that are involved so that you both have a clear understanding of what the scope of the relationship really looks like, what the scope of the relationship is, do it up front while the relationship is still in the good position before any, you know, hard feelings might exist or before too many emotions can get involved. Get those terms down in writing while everybody's in a clear, cool, calm, collected head and get things taken care of for you. Yeah, you know what, uh, and there's a continuum here for complexity, right? So if I, if my business, uh, I'm no longer a sole proprietor, I have an, I have an LLC, but I, I have a small burger shop. Um, am I going to require everybody comes to my counter buy a burger to sign a contract? Well, probably not, right? Um, but if I'm delivering multi-million dollar services that are a combination of people delivered services and technology over a multi-year period, I mean, then of course you're going to have contracts. And so there's a there's a continuum of, of all in between. Um, for I, my my coaching, I guess, would be for for businesses that are are afraid of putting a bad taste in the mouth of your customer, saying, hey, we we want something less formal. Uh, uh, you know, contracts are there to protect, you know, the people that come after us, right? If I, if, if I win the lottery, if, if you win the lottery and I get hit by a bus, you know, it's the people who own this relationship after us that the, the contracts simply lay out the rules of the road, right? And the expectations uh, for us to, to, to navigate the relationship. Um, Christine, what, what, what kinds of things should employers be on the lookout to make sure that it is included in their contracts? And I'm thinking stuff like indemnity and insurance, uh, termination clauses, et cetera. Absolutely. So the, the indemnity is, is always going to be a huge one. So basically what an, an indemnity provision in the contract is going to state, what happens if there's a third party that is upset? Say so you're working together and there's a third party that's going to be impacted by the scope of your relationship between the two contracting parties. And that third party is upset, they get injured whatever it might be, and they decide that they're going to sue somebody. And say it's, you have a, you're, say you're that contractor, you're a paper contractor, so to speak. Maybe you're doing the remodel, but you sub out who's doing the plumbing. You're subbing out who does the, the drywall, who does the roofing, things like that. And say that plumber that's doing the remodel does a really poor job, and there's a huge leak in that house. And so now the, con the, the homeowner is contracted with you as the developer but you technically didn't do anything wrong, right? You're not the one that was swinging that hammer. You're not the one that was installing that pipe that's now burst. The person that installed that is the subcontractor and you want that subcontractor to be on the hook for any of those damages. So in that case, you'd want to make sure that your contract as the developer or the remodeling contractor, that you have a, an indemnity provision in there that says, if there's a claim that arises out of your work as the plumber, then you are responsible for any damages that I, as the contractor, may sustain relating to that work that you've done because that homeowner is going to sue me as the contractor. They're not going to necessarily go and track down, okay, who are all the other people that subcontracted right. under the one contract? They're going to say, I don't care. That's not my problem. My beef is with you as the contractor who I have paid money to. And so you as the contractor want to turn around and say, okay, I, I'll deal, I'll take care of the homeowner because that is my job. That's my contractual obligation. But at the same time, I'm going to be pursuing you and say, hey, you need to make me whole because this is your problem, not mine at the end of the day. And so that's what an indemnification provision essentially is all about. And you want to know on which end are you, are you uh, on the beneficiary side of things where some other uh, party has to indemnify and defend you against the claim? Or are you the one that has to defend and indemnify another party? And that's important because that includes attorney's fees and costs, things like that, where even if that amount of the dispute may be relatively small, attorney's fees can go high real quick. And you want to make sure that you have an understanding as to who's on the hook for that if, if things were to go sideways on a particular project. Right. Okay. And yeah, I think every single one of these subtopics could be a whole series we, we do. Uh, let, let, let's move from maybe indemnification uh, I, I'm curious about limits of liability. What I, I think a lot of, uh, especially smaller growing companies, aren't aware of the kinds of protections they can put in for themselves around limits of liability. It's, you know, if you provide a service that only provides you know x amount of value, it's not reasonable 
that you should be able to get sued for why that's you know a thousand times that value can, can you can you speak to that absolutely so i'm always a proponent of trying to find ways to have limitations of liability in your contract and it's going to depend the, the, the enforceability and the scope of those limitations of liability will vary to, to an extent from industry to industry and jurisdiction to jurisdiction so um, when I'm thinking about a limitation of liability, an easy one that comes to mind that I have successfully um, defended um, in court is for a home inspector. So a home inspector, you know, if you're going to go buy a house and you're going to hire a home inspector to, to take a look at that house, make sure that everything is in operational format, you know, if there's no big issues, um, you know, there's not a foundation, the house is settling and things are cracking, things like that, um, and you're relying on that in home inspectors report and basically stamp of approval on the property. Yeah. Well, sometimes they slip through the cracks. Sometimes, so to speak, no pun intended there, but there <laughs> may be instances where, you know, something was just missed. And then if I'm representing the home inspector, I'm going to have them have in their contract that says, if there is some sort of an issue that maybe was missed or that you know i didn't properly identify for you or you know whatever it might be then the maximum amount that you are be able to recover against that particular home inspection inspector it may be the cost of whatever you paid for the home inspection itself it may be five thousand dollars it may be whatever dollar amount is makes sense in that particular situation and what that jurisdiction and the industry allows to happen and so I have successfully had contracts where we limited to the cost of the inspection itself, which say $650, you know, is a pretty common ballpark for a lot of home inspections, at least in the Colorado area. And we were able to say, okay, well, we'll refund you that $650 that we paid, that you paid me to do the inspection, but after that, you need to go away because contractually that's what you agreed to. And another piece of that is you can also, um, you may be able to, add a provision that limits the time frame that somebody can bring a claim against you. So in that same contract, we had added a one-year statute of limitations that says that you have until one year after either the date of the contract or one year after the issue was discovered to bring a lawsuit. And if you fail to bring the lawsuit within that time frame, then again, you're barred. Um, the, the statutory uh, time frame, at least under Colorado law, for a breach of contract, which is what this would be, would typically be three years. But we would, we, at least in Colorado and other some jurisdictions, you can agree to shorten that to one year, two years, something like that. And so look at different ways that you might be able to limit your liability and just keep an understanding that, again, it may be industry specific and it may be dependent on your specific jurisdiction where you're doing the services or providing the products that we're talking about here. Right. So for contracts in general, the more the more specificity you can lay out, payment terms, uh, how services will be delivered and or product will be delivered. The more specific you can lay it out, the more you protect you and the client um, in the case that there is a dispute. But the big ways that you can really protect uh, your exposure, your liability as a company uh, is uh, the first one you hit. I think, Christina, is indemnity. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And the second is limits of liability. Uh, and it's forgive the terrible joke, but it's like if you're a, a baker uh, and, and you botch the wedding cake, uh, you should, you know, if you have a limit of liability to the price of good ser uh, de uh, services delivered, you should be on the hook uh, to refund uh, the cost of the cake, not for the cost of ruining the marriage, right? So uh, <laughs> that's why you put those things uh, in, in place. Anything else you'd want to say on contract before we move on to the next action? Um, I think that the other one I would just like to hit on is whether or not attorney's fees are recoverable under a contract. Most states, um, unless the re recovery of attorney's fees are specifically laid out in a contract or there's some sort of a statute in place that allows for the recovery of attorney's fees, each party is going to be deemed to be responsible for their own fees. And again, as I mentioned, you may have the, the value of the dispute between you and the other party may be minimal. But attorney's fees can rack up really quickly. And so you want to make sure that you know, you know, am I on the hook also if I lose that I also have to pay not only the $500 value of the dispute, but also the $1,500 in attorney's fees that are on top of that. Now it's turned into a $2,000 claim as opposed to just a $500 claim. So just understanding, yeah. you know, what other areas there may be of liability for you. 
and we could probably say this for every single one of these uh, top four actions that we're recommending, but uh, boy, the if you're a small business owner paying, at, and, and everybody's different, so uh, you know whether it's $200 an hour or $500 an hour, then an attorney's gonna charge you. Uh, that's, that can sound really scary and expensive when you're trying to survive, but you know, asking an attorney to spend two, three hours putting together your really basic contract, I mean, that they, an attorney can go wild on you, right, Christina, uh, and, and make something way more complex than it has to be. But if you give really specific, narrow instructions, here's my budget, I just want something simple to protect me. You know, spending a few hundred or a couple thousand dollars even up front could save you thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands down the road. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move to our uh, third action. Uh, and this one might sound, this one might not seem intuitive, right? Um, uh, when I think about an entrepreneur or a growing business, small, mid-sized company, I think of, okay, legal structure, that makes sense. Limit my liability, my corporate structure, my contracts, limit my li liability, uh, uh, my indemnification, and get out my T's crossed, my I's dotted, that makes sense. Um, what is What does insurance have to do with legal structure and why would, uh, why would a business be taking advice from an attorney about insurance? Great question. Um, and it, you're, you're absolutely right that people don't really think of this as a legal issue, but you need to understand that having the right insurance in place is the, it, it, it's one of the most important things that you can do for your business to protect yourself in the event of a legal claim. So um, there's all kinds of different types of insurance depend and it's going to be dependent on your industry and what what exactly it is that you're doing but you at the end of the day want somebody else to be paying the liability and rather than you having to come up with the money out of your business account itself and so how do you do that you have insurance i mean we all understand you know like health insurance you know if if we get in a car accident you know hopefully we have the insurance that'll pay for our you know if we're in a hospital or or emergency space, things like that. But the same is true of a business. And so if somebody slips and falls on your property, uh, you'll ha your general liability insurance should kick in. And so rather you're, you're paying your premiums on a regular basis and those premiums maybe feel like a gut punch every month when they're coming out of your account, but you're gonna want, you'll be so thankful for them if you have somebody that slips and falls that rather than you having to come up with 50, 60, thousand dollars a couple hundred thousand dollars who knows what it is that you've been paying you know this insurance company to step in and take over for you so right the, the so many types of insurance whether it's like the general liability is going to typically if somebody gets injured on your property things like that cyber security is something that a lot of people don't think about and is a huge issue right now especially with current events you want to make sure that if your system were to get hacked and your client or customer information were to be uh, accessed by an unauthorized person, you know, that there could be significant fines and things that can uh, happen if you don't have the right safety, safety nets in place and, and your cyber insurance can help you to deal with some of those issues and some of those claims. Um, if you're a professional, like say like myself as a lawyer, or if you're in the medical prof profession or accounting, things like that, you'll have malpractice insurance that basically takes care of your negligence as a, for any errors and omissions that you may make as in your professional capacity. You wanna make sure you have employment insurance, practices insurance in place. So if somebody says that they've been sexually harassed or wrongfully terminated, things like that, there's insurance policies that you can have in place that can protect you and pay for any settlements or, or things that may arise from those types of claims. And there's a in, there's different types of insurance for, you know, that that's an, another, could be its, its own separate webinar for sure, but um, having the right contracts in place coupled with the right insurance in place. I mean, those are your two strongest lines of defense in the event that you see you find yourself on the wrong side of a claim. And just making sure that you understand what does your insurance cover? And sometimes more importantly, what does it not cover? Because there may be exclusions to your policy that are critical. And so make sure that you, if you're working with an attorney, make sure that they understand the importance of the insurance and that they understand you know, as you're looking at different contracts, is there a contractual obligation to carry insurance um, at a certain level or naming another entity or another person as an 
insured under your policy that relates to your work for that company. So there can be a lot of complicated issues when it comes to insurance, but insurance and legal, what we're talking the legal foundation, they're paramount for risk mitigation purposes. Yeah, right. Um, there, and, and I think maybe the only thing I'd share before we move on to our last topic here would be, there, there are so many forms of insurance that I think most businesses don't even realize exist, right? I mean, we all know health insurance, we all know property and cash, uh, 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 property casualty insurance. Um, so we, 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 off the top of our head, we're like, yeah, okay, I need insurance to make sure that if a tornado or a hurricane blows my business down, you know, I can, I can rebuild. Uh, I know that I need insurance uh, for, uh, for my health insurance for myself and, and or for my employees, depending on your, your size and legal requirements. But there are so many uh, smaller and sometimes very inexpensive forms of insurance that can really help fill in some, some of the, uh, I'd say fill in the cracks, but kind of the uh, protects you from the, what you don't know uh, that kind of, that can come back and but yeah anything that you'd want to uh, wrap on this before we move on to protecting your brand yeah um, I, I think it's just it's important to have a strong um, relationship and understanding I, I am a big proponent of, of working with brokers and different people that you know they're the experts in the industry the insurance industry they're gonna know different types of insurance like you said that people don't even realize exist and I am a big proponent proponent of more insurance is better than less. And you can, it surprises a lot of people that to get a significant more amount of insurance coverage doesn't mean like, just because you maybe go from $500,000 in coverage to a million dollars in coverage, doesn't mean that you're paying twice as much. A lot of times it means you're paying an extra 10 bucks a month, you know, and you're getting twice as much insurance. And so don't just be looking for the cheapest absolute possible policy out there. Look and make sure that, you know, are you truly covered? And it, maybe you need to have an umbrella policy that it, it kind of fills in the cracks, but it also it covers the things that you may not otherwise be expecting to, to pop up for you. Yeah, and I think the, the last thing I would maybe add before we move on to our final topic is think, think about this. Uh, I think uh, our listeners should be thinking about this as the layering on of protection, right? So your most basic foundational protection is your entity set up right, right? So if you're a sole proprietorship, and you're and and you're running this home remodeling business, and you mess up somebody's kitchen. Uh, can they sue you? Take all the business equipment and your truck, but also can take your house from you. Well, basic basic baseline entity, and then contracts contracts with your customers, contracts with your suppliers, right? A next layer, kind of filling in the crack, more minutia, and then insurance, kind of is this umbrella. Forgive the metaphor, overused metaphor of umbrella and insurance, but it's really the umbrella that over all of that, right? Um, Absolutely. And then the, then maybe the last thing, I think it kind of sets up our last topic that I just think people don't think about. Um, it, it, it's your brand. If, you know, maybe you didn't have a brand 20 years ago when you started this company, um, but now you're a known name in, in the marketplace, in, in, uh, in, in your city, your region. Um, and, that, and that name, and reputation in and of itself has value, has real value for many people. Um, and there's and there's things contractually, legally to do to protect it. Get, get, share what some of those things are. Absolutely. So you may not really be thinking about the your brand as as its own separate value, but it, it absolutely does exist. You've got your secret sauce, so so to speak. You know, if you're if you're in the restaurant industry, then it literally may be a secret sauce that you you put out there, you know, KFC seven spices or whatever it is that they use <laughs> right, for right. I mean, that is kept under seven whatever it is that goes into the formula, right. I mean they're all kept under absolute lock and key, you know, they've all been protected, you know, and you can't go out and find it because if those um things were to become public knowledge, then it reduces the value of those companies, right? And so um, whether it's, you know, maybe you're providing written content to somebody, you know, maybe you're a creator, maybe you're an artist, you know, if that's the case, then you'd want to have it, do a copyright on that, on that um, document so that other people can't steal it and use it and represent it as being their own work of art or writing or whatever that might be. Um, 
It may be just your name brand or your logo. Like you said, there's recognition. You build up recognition and you build up brand loyalty over time with your customers. And you want to make sure that somebody else doesn't come in and start encroaching on that relationship and that brand identity that you have created. And so um, there's different layers of protection that you can do as far as protecting your brand. Um, if you wanted to protect your business name, maybe it's a really cool business name or you have a really cool slogan or you're really proud of your logo. You know, I would say at a minimum, register your trade, register it as a trademark or a trade name or something with your local, with your state secretary of state website. Um, that's the simplest way to protect the name brand and logos and things like that. But that's going to be limited to your state. So that means if uh, if I'm here in Colorado and I were to go register Gilbert's law office or my my Glow logo, something like that, it would be protected here in Colorado. But somebody in Kansas in the state over could have their own Gilbertson Law Office and steal my logo. And there's nothing that I would necessarily be able to do with that at this point. But if I were to take it a step further and file a formal trademark with the United States um, Patent and Trademark Office, that means that I have, if my application gets approved, that means that I have priority over anybody else in the entire country. And in some cases, if you take another step of layer and you file it internationally, that means I could stop anybody around the world that tries to use Gilbertson Law Office or Glow or, you know, I mean, there's, this is a very simplistic explanation of it, but um, that's one way that you protect your brand is just the name, logo, trademark um, of the slogan, things like that. But you may also, um, you also have what's called trade secrets. Whether you think that you have trade secrets or not, or if you've ever heard that or not, your business has them. And what does that mean? It's everything from your client and customer list. It's your internal processes, like how do you do your business? It's your um, it, anything that is unique to your business or that maybe you have tweaked to work for your business. Those are all considered trade secrets that it's not information that's available to the public. So somebody that comes in and they're maybe they're an independent contractor or they're an employee, you want to make sure that you're protecting your brand and protecting them from being able to take that information, those trade secrets but that they've learned from working with you and either start their own business that uses that information or they take it to a competitor or something like that. So if that were the case, I, that's why I always recommend when you're hiring employees or contractors or vendors that have access to your internal operations, Non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements are huge. Um, that way, if somebody does start trying to use your secret sauce for their own gain that is contrary to what you're trying to do, you can send them that cease and desist. Say, hey, you signed this non-disclosure agreement and you need to stop using this immediately or I'm going to be suing you for misappropriation, is the legal term, or misuse of those trade secrets or those trade, um, those protected brand values. And so, uh, there's just, there's a lot of different ways that you could do that, but give it some thought, like take a step back and say, what makes my business unique? What is it about my business that makes my clients or my customers come back to me? What attracts them to me? How, and then say, okay, how do I protect those things so that the guy next to me doesn't benefit off of the hard work and the things that I put in to build this brand and this brand identity? Yeah, you know, I think, I think it's probably, there are some businesses that lend themselves to uh, trademark value um, and just simply the name recognition. If you're uh, if you're a restaurant uh, that is just known regionally uh, of having an amazing name, you've got more Google reviews than anybody else. You've got amazing signage. Culturally, you're just part of the community and everybody knows your name. There's value with just the name itself. There's also plenty of other probably listeners that that are maybe more business to business and, and maybe they're, they're a big company nobody's heard of, right? Um, uh, but I think one of, the, one of the areas I would want to focus people is in this area of non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality agreements with employers, employees and, and, and contractors. Um, if for no other reason, uh, and you mentioned it, Christina, a, a, a customer list, right? Um, I think increasingly, and it could be another webinar, but increasingly non-compete agreements don't uh, hold as much uh, weight as they used to, and it's, and it's, it's state by state. Um, uh, you can't generally prevent uh, an employee who leaves from working in their field of expertise. 
Um, but you sure as heck can prevent someone from stealing your customers, right? And if the only, and the only way they would have known it is by working for you. Can you give maybe some more specific guidance for, for how businesses can protect themselves in this whole non-compete non -compete confidentiality area? Absolutely, yeah, the non-competes are going, they're, they're becoming less and less effective across the board. But you're absolutely right that even if somebody has the right to go and work somewhere else, you want to make sure that you are clear as to what is a trade secret or what is something that is specific to your business that you want to be protecting. And make sure that people understand that. That means stamping things confidential. That means just being upfront and clear and defining what is considered to be confidential information. What is What are your trade secrets? What are things like that? And making sure that you have it in writing that people are limited and not able to go through, go take that information to a competitor. I mean, that's, that's the biggest issue. And, and I see it a lot. Um, because a lot of the workforce is very transient. They go from one employer to the next, to the next, to the next. And sometimes, you know, they use that experience and say, hey, well, we used to do it this way. And this is something that I can add value to me as, as a new candidate, potentially, is if I can bring this information to you and the, this behind the scenes, you know, pricing, or this is how we do things at my old business, stuff like that. So the NDA and the confidentiality agreement are are huge. And I, like I said, whether it's an employee, a contractor, business partners, investors, anybody who may be able to have access to your secret sauce and those things that make your business unique, they need to be signing off on those documents because those non or non disclosure and confidentiality agreements, those are enforceable and it, it will save you a lot of heartache and, and stress down the road. And it makes it a lot easier for you to stop people from being able to use your um, your secret sauce, essentially. Yeah, very good. Hey, Christina, I'm going to wrap it here. Uh, I, I want to give you an opportunity to take 20 seconds and, and tell tell our listeners, you know, more about you and your firm and see if they want to uh, leverage your services at any point. Absolutely, appreciate that. So, um, Christina Gilbertson with Gilbertson Law Office. I'm located in Colorado, but I service clients in a few different states here across the West. Um, I typically act as general outside counsel. Um, advising clients on everything through the formation, through sale of the business, brand protection, employee issues, contracts, all the things we talked about today are all things that I help educate my clients with so that they can work to protect everything they're working so hard to build and they know that they have a partner along the way because uh, it's important to have some people in your back corner. And I work with my clients, not on an hourly basis, but via subscription and flat fee so that you know exactly what you're going to be paying in order to protect your brand and protect your business and get to the goals that you're striving for. So happy to speak with anybody. If anybody has any follow-up questions about stuff we talked today, talked about today, I know we've, it's a real high level and we went over a lot of stuff. So feel free to reach out with questions and I'm happy to chat with you. I appreciate it, Christine. And, and as always, there's no... Uh, Full transparency. Uh, there's no financial benefit uh, for sure uh, uh, in this relationship. Just simply wanted to uh, tap someone who we think have, has a lot of expertise in this area. So if you can use Christina, great. Uh, 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 hopefully, uh, regardless, the information shared today uh, was valuable and uh, helping you run your business. Uh, and with that, uh, this this is also what we do. We help people comply with the law. Usually, we have these conversations in the context of HR and tax law. Uh, but we're really here to take care of the back office administration, the administrative functions of payroll and human resources uh, uh, so that businesses can focus on growth. Uh, and until next week, uh, I thank you for your time. Christina, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And thanks all. Until next week, we'll talk to you then.